Good evening and welcome to our FM Hangout session uh, six. Uh, we want to uh, welcome each of you. And uh, before we start, let me ask Frank to best to open our um, uh, evening with with prayer with, with an opening prayer, and then um, you can take it away. So Frank, could you lead us with a prayer? Yeah, thanks, Sir Lake. Thanks for this opportunity to uh, unravel some of the um, warp and woof of the firstborn matrix worldview. Let's pray. Father, it's a privilege to be in your family. Thank you for shaping us and molding us and preparing us for eternity and for the job descriptions that we'll have as joint heirs with Christ, ruling and reigning with him over the nations. So thank you for this big picture. Help us to understand it more clear will be in our conversations and take these threads uh, to the nation so that uh, uh, a group of righteous people will be harvested from every nation. And we look forward to that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Frank. Okay, so I use the word warp and woof, and, and I've talked about five pillars and five pearls. So this... <laughs> This week I added another quintet or quintuple, and that is five progressions. So that's what we're actually going through now is the, the progressions of the patriarchal quadrilateral. There are four of them that help summarize the, the, um, the things that we've learned about the five pearls. And, and then, um, and I've broken those, those um, at least the four that we're working in, the patriarchal quadrilateral, I, I've called them, they're all under undergraduate uh, education. So since Surly and I work in a, a university environment, I thought this is a great way to communicate the development of ideas. And so we're, we're using a cascading group of two, individuals, two tribes, two nations, and two kingdoms to reflect on the authority, the covenants, typology, etc. So, so that's what we're doing right now, but I just wanted to take you back to this, uh, this fifth slide, and uh, so you have a, a big picture of uh, the five pillars. Uh, firstborn matrix has to do with FAC. The, the, if you look at the five pearls, it has to do with the firstborn rights and uh, the, the firstborn responsibility with their jurisdictions, and then the firstborn replacement or um, a second born opportunity because of the unfaithfulness of the firstborn. So that's under the two siblings and covenants. Uh, binary theology is another pillar and that uh, is the interweaving of physical and spiritual components throughout each of these pearls. So we have birthright and a spiritual blessing under the, the first pearl, firstborn. We have the role of the king and the priest, that's uh, um, physical and spiritual. The physical, the king over, um, works on jurisdiction between loving your neighbor executing justice, and then the priest works on the relationship between loving God and executing righteousness. And then the, uh, of course, with the covenants, the pearl there are the physical offspring of Israel, which is from, the, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the spiritual offspring would be the international church, which are those who have put their faith in Jesus. So that's uh, there's a physical and spiritual component there. And then typology, there's uh, two perspectives of the historic and the prophetic. So historic is actual physical historical narratives. And then prophetic is the implications of those there's on the future kingdom of God. And then salvation, S, the, the physical spiritual component there is the... Um, the human commitment of faith, love, and hope, and then the um, 
uh, divine commitment to of God's response of justification, sanctification, and glorification. So that's how we have a physical, spiritual interweaving within the pearl of salvation. Gospel trilogy, and that reflects on that fifth um, element of salvation where you have uh, faith, love, and hope working with justification, sanctification, glorification. So that's the gospel trilogy. So now we're kind of covering the patriarchal quadrilateral, trying to walk through these four undergraduate layers of education. So I'm using elementary, middle, high, and university slash college for those four levels. Quintessential wisdom will be graduate school level education. So that's where we will tackle of the Trinity, for example, uh, inspiration, polytheism, and damnation. I mean, there's there's many mysteries and, and complexities within the Christian faith. So it's, it's taking the two philosophies, I, I, I call it, of, um, of mystery versus wisdom. So that will will be the higher uh, ed graduate level um, component of the, that's the fifth pearl, quintessential wisdom. And this is where I hope, I trust by God's spirit working that little by little he will bring into our midst scholars who, who are able to address these mysteries and provide a rethinking of biblical Christian based on these hermeneutics of typology and the five pearls that we've talked about, instead of using what we have for the last 2,000 years, 1,500 years, is the influence of Greek philosophy on the development of Christian theology. So this is where I'm hoping with the, the graduate level program that uh, those mysteries will be unraveled and that God's wisdom will become clarified. Okay, so we're going to now jump to um, the patriarchal quadrilateral, the examples of this cascading of couplets from two individuals to two tribes to two nations to two kingdoms. We, um, in, in the last session five, we reviewed the questions that are a backdrop to the two individuals. So there are uh, three screens of questions that we went through uh, little by little to to kind of underscore what um, you should be able to um, understand from the stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, the four patriarchs that are whose stories are found in Genesis 12 through 50. And uh, we we reviewed, I think there are six couplets within those, stories of individuals where the older shall serve the younger. If you remember that uh, prophecy that was uttered in Genesis 25 in regards to the twin boys that uh, were uh, in Rebecca's womb, those two boys would become two nations. The older would serve the younger. So we reflected on, on that uh, those six couplets of individuals where the older shall serve the younger with uh, within the patriarchal stories. And now we're going to move on. Oh, and the two, uh, the two nations that are represented by Esau and Jacob are the Edomites and the Israelites. So if you recall the land of Canaan and that promise that God gave to Abraham that he would have this land, you will see that Esau was entitled to two thirds of it. The firstborn was entitled to a double portion. So Esau was entitled to two thirds, but he sold his birthright, his one third portion, his extra portion for a bowl of stew. And that then became Jacob. So that's how Jacob wound up with the two Northern thirds, the upper two thirds of the promised land and Esau wound up in the desert portion in the south where the Edomites ended up living. Uh, you might have heard of Petra before. You might have heard of the Sinai desert area. This is where the Edomites had their, their nation. And when uh, Israel came out of, out of Egypt 
and Moses was trying to lead them directly to their inheritance up in the north, the Edomites said, no, we're not going to let you pass through our portion of the land. We still have um, bad memories of the interaction between Esau and Jacob. So anyways, those are the two nations, the Edomites and the Israelites, in regards to this first layer of undergrad education, which we'll call elementary school. So now we're going to move to the two tribes. So Joseph uh, was unfaithful, maintaining the Mosaic Covenant, so Judah was granted leadership responsibility. So, um, Surlay, if you want to point to the next suite of slides where the two tribes then becomes the red letter. Right now, you still are on the two individuals' focus. Right here. So that's still under the elementary. Keep keep going down. Another couple slides. That's the second, the third, and now comes the summary, uh, the transition to the two tribes. So as we've underscored, uh, Joseph was chosen over Reuben under the two individual schema. Uh, remember, Reuben had done something that uh, defiled his father's bed. And so there was, because of that transgression, Reuben was passed ask for and giving now a chance an opportunity for the second born well in this case joseph was the 11th born but he was the first wife of jacob's second wife he was a he was the first son of jacob's second wife rachel his favored wife and so Joseph then was the one who inherits the double portion of this land. So that's why he has two tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. But again, those, that's all reflected under the, uh, the two individuals. But as time goes on, <clears throat> Joseph was unfaithful. If you read uh, the period of uh, Judges, there in, um, in the book of Judges, uh, you'll see that it just becomes a hodgepodge of, of um, sin and uh, God, and Israel cries out for help. You know, God sends in some kind of of uh, country to execute judgment, and then the people cry out for help, and God raises a judge and delivers them. And so you have this cycle that goes on during the period of judges. But it turns out that. Um, that finally, in uh, Psalm 78, God says, this, um, this relationship that I've had with Joseph is going to come to an end. So this is our first slide of uh, questions to review this middle school trajectory of undergrad education. Okay, So during the period of the judges, list three ways that Joseph's tribe reflected the firstborn inheritance in terms of property, prestige, and priesthood. So, you guys already know the property one, right? We already mentioned that. How did Joseph get a double portion of Canaan? Um, Manasseh and Ephraim. Yes, get one. Those two sons of Joseph were treated like their uncles. They all received a similar portion of the tri of the property that that uh, Joshua when he let them in divided it up. So uh, you won't find a tribe named Joseph because Joseph actually gets two tribes, and so you, that's why we hear about Ephraim. And Manasseh. How about prestige? Any way that Joseph stands out as a leader amongst his nation, amongst his brethren? Could that be Pharaoh? 
Huh? No, no. Remember, Moses is the one who brought them out of Egypt. And Moses is from the tribe of Levi. He's not from Joseph's tribe. But when Moses passes on the baton of leadership, oh, who does he Joshua, choose? Joshua. Yeah, Joshua. And you know what tribe Joshua's from? Ephraim. Uh, Ephraim. Ephraim. Yes. He is from that younger of the two sons who was given the birthright with their uncles. So remember, Grandpa Jacob crossed his hands and put his his right hand on the younger son, Ephraim. And so Joshua happens to be a descendant of that younger son, Ephraim. And so this is kind of, this is kind of to be expected in light of uh, in light of Ephraim having the upper hand, the right hand, and uh, and for Moses to pass on the leadership of, uh, to uh, an offspring of Joseph from the tribe of Ephraim. So that's kind of cool. And if you do a study of the judges uh, and look at an index of judges during this period, what I've noted is that more than half of them are ascended from Joseph. So that, that kind of indicates this prestige is on Joseph of leadership. Now, granted, they're intermittent judges, and, uh, <clears throat> and they come from both, from all the tribes. There's different tribes that are represented in the judges, but half of them are from either Ephraim or Manasseh. Gideon is another famous judge. He is from Manasseh. The last judge who, um, who uh, anointed King David when the transition was made to Judah. Do you remember what, uh, what tribe he's from? Uh, it's about Samuel, right? Yeah, Samuel, exactly. It says in, in 1 Samuel that he is from the hill towns of Ephraim. So... I think he's from Ephraim's descendant as well, from Joseph. So that's a, that's an indicator then of the prestige that is on Joseph. And then how about the priesthood? How does Joseph's the firstborn rights falling upon him reflected in the priestly caste? And this uh, has to do with God's house of worship, his, his temple. Now, of course, in this time, it, it was not yet a physical temple uh, of bricks. It was a, a portable shrine, a portable tabernacle. But it was primarily in a town called Shiloh. Shiloh. Shiloh happens to be in Ephraim's territory. So to me, that is a red flag that says, yes, God is allowing his presence, the Ark of the Covenant, the Shekinah glory, you know, that, uh, that presence of God there in the midst of Ephraim's territory in this town of Shiloh. So that's, that's kind of uh, another way that Joseph stands out from his brothers in that he had this privilege of having God's house on his territory. Isn't that cool? God's blessing. So those are all elements then of uh, this birthright and blessing being upon Joseph. But now as we move to uh, Psalm 78, <clears throat> we find out that God says in, in this chapter, and again, it takes some meditation and some time to read through it. It's a historical psalm, but it starts off by saying, Ephraim was unfaithful in the day of battle. Their archers turned back. And then it recounts historically how Israel as a whole has been unfaithful, not just Ephraim or Joseph, um, Manasseh, but Israel as a whole. So it recounts a number of ways. And then in the end, it culminates with this dramatic statement where God says, from now on, I'm no longer going to choose Joseph or Ephraim. I'm going to choose David. 
and the tribe of Judah. It's very, very clear that God is making a tr dramatic transition from his first, his first recipient to a second recipient from Joseph to Judah. Now, <clears throat> uh, you know, you can say, well, when did this transition happen? So one of the ways that I like to look at that uh, transitioning happen is during the, the period um, documented in 1 Samuel versus uh, chapter 3 through chapter 6. And this is when Israel was at war with the Philistines. Um, the, the Philistines were, um, you know, had defeated Israel. And so uh, Israel said, okay, let's take our magic weapon, the Ark of the Covenant, right? That's a magic weapon for Israel. So they went to Shiloh, and Eli, who was the high priest at that time, had his uh, allowed for this to happen. Two, his two sons took this ark into battle. And sure enough, the Philistines overwhelmed the Israelites and took captive this precious throne of God, the symbolic throne of God, the holy of, um, you know, the Ark of the Covenant that was in the holy place of the tabernacle. And it was in the Philistine territory for maybe six months, and they had different problems with it. Their god fell off its perch. You know, they had some boils and hemorrhoids and different things. And finally, they said, "You know, forget this. We don't. This, this is really a powerful um, artifact, and obviously, we are not worthy to have this here." So they put it on an ox cart, and uh, you you probably remember the. Um, the mother oxen had their calves tied up to a tree, and they were still compelled to leave the Philistine territory and head back to Israel, taking the ark back to its homeland. Now, the interesting story is, yeah, the interesting story is that it stopped. I have there as the last question, what town and farmer received this precious cargo. So again, this is, you'll have to do a bit your own Bible study on this from 1 Samuel, but you'll see that it goes to a border town of Judah. It doesn't go back to Ephraim. It doesn't go back to Shiloh. It goes to a town called Beth Shemesh. And it even gives the name of the farmer where this ox cart takes the Ark of the Covenant. And the first name? Joshua? Yeah, how did you know? I'm reading it as long, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's right on this. Isn't that cool? Yeah. That there is a Joshua of the tribe of Judah to welcome God's presence. Just like there was a Joshua of the tribe of Ephraim who mm. brought God's presence into the Promised Land initially the first judge of Israel. So, I mean, to me, this has just got spirit in a very concrete manner to display uh, the, the significance of the word Joshua. <laughs> and, of course, Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew word for Joshua. So that is Jesus' name. And, of course, he's, he's our... Um, our cornerstone for the new temple that he's building with uh, representatives from every nation. So anyways, this is just really beautiful to study this transition as God changes his changes from the first tribe having, um, having these firstborn privileges to now a new tribe, the tribe of Judah. Let's see. I had another question here. How is Eli's house a prototype of this transition? So you probably have all you probably all remember the story of hearing a voice, right? And Eli the priest saying, "Oh no, it wasn't me who called you. 
And uh, finally, after the third time, Eli says to Samuel, when that voice calls you again, just say, you know, here am I, Lord. You'll know, speak, Lord. Uh, I'm listening. And sure enough, God uses Samuel to pass on a warning of judgment to Eli because Eli's family has been unfaithful in their priestly responsibilities. And so um, that was the hard news that God gave to Samuel to pass on to Eli, that Eli's household was no longer going to be accepted in the priestly line. And sure enough, that day when the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant, Eli, his two sons, died that day um, when the Philistines captured the Ark. Eli, when he heard about uh, the Ark going into Kitty, he fell off his chair and he broke his neck and he died. Um, one of his sons had, uh, one of his son's wives had a grandchild that was born to Eli that day as well, or in that season. And do you remember the name of that grandson? Mm. It was Ichabod. Yes. And Ichabod means God's. I think it means God's glory has departed. Ah. So. Same way that God had said to Eli, your jurisdiction as a priest is, is going to come to an end because of the unfaithfulness of your sons and, and this ministry has not been taken uh, with the sanctification, the, the sanctity that it needs. Uh, Eli's um, responsibilities were coming to an end. And same thing with the house of Joseph. Their responsibilities were coming to an end as well. So that's how Eli's house is a prototype. Okay, I think we covered all of saw, uh, that second question. Um, during the period of the kings, okay, now as we move into Judah, list the three ways that Judah's tribe reflected the firstborn inheritance in terms of property, prestige, and priesthood. So now that we've made this transition from Joseph to Judah, remember one of the concepts that we've talked about with, um, uh, with um, the third pearl is that when that, that there's a second born who gets an opportunity, right? If the first born is unfaithful, there's a second born who gets the opportunity. But not only does that second born get the opportunity, but there is a magnification shift of that, of the blessings and the birthright, the, the, the physical and the spiritual blessings upon the second born. It's a magnification shift. And it's because it, it falls in line with that promise in Genesis 25, to Isaac and Rebekah that said, um, the older will be subservient to the younger. In other words, whoever gets that second opportunity will be stronger and blessed more than the first one who had the responsibility. You follow that? Yeah. So there is a magnification shift. So as we look at these three uh, reflections during the time of Judah, now that Judah has that um, that responsibility of being the leader, how does his property, what, well, you know, how does, how does he inherit property that might have a magnification shift from what Joseph received? King David um, and the temple? Actually, uh, Solomon was the one who built it. Is, would that be it? Yeah, the temple. So you're looking at that third component there, the priesthood. Oh, okay. You see, the um, Judah now, as we move over from, from Joseph to Judah, you no longer have a portable tabernacle, right? right. Now that the ark has been moved to Judah's territory, King David says, I want to build a for God, right? He, you know, why should I be living in a, ta in a in a beautiful house, a beautiful castle, and God's 
castle is this portable tent. So uh, King David and his son Solomon then wind up building a beautiful temple. So yes, there is a magnification shift as we move from a portable shrine to a permanent temple. And FYI, I mean, just FYI, the new Jerusalem will be that new temple that will be relocated where that temple of Solomon used to be. So in, in the new, when Jesus sets up his kingdom, there is going to be some, some edifice, the, this new Jerusalem, heaven, and I think it will be somehow uh, scoped out in that same reign, where the same area of that sacred land in Israel. So yeah, that, that beautiful temple is uh, part of the magnification shift that moved uh, from Joseph to Judah. And then you also mentioned uh, prestige too, Surle, and your reference to King David and King Solomon. So you now have a dynasty of kings, Judah, as reigning. Whereas for Joseph, you had intermittent judges. But now we have a dynasty of kings. So this is a magnification shift as well as we um, move to this dynasty. And who is the last one in the dynasty of kings of King David? Jeroboam? No. It's our Messiah. It's Jesus. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's why I had to be a son of David. That's why both Matthew and Luke have genealogies that underscore Jesus' lineage to King David. He is the last of the dynasty. And he his kingdom will be forever and ever. Isn't that cool? That's, that's a, a beautiful magnification shift from Joseph to Judah. In line of in light of the the role of uh, jurisdiction of the king, how about property? What what kind of inheritance do you think we can look at under Judah? Jerusalem. So yeah, Jerusalem is this is the city where the tabernacle the temple was built, and so just like Shiloh was a the city where um, where the portable tabernacle was in Ephraim. Um, Jerusalem is been chosen. Now, Jerusalem is right on the border of Benjamin's territory as well. So uh, both Benjamin and Judah happen to be the two tribes that actually separate uh, when we have a, a divided kingdom after Solomon, when Rehoboam takes over. <clears throat> but that's not, you know, that might be a double portion if you want to say those two tribes, you know, that uh, Judah gets. But I'm looking at a much bigger picture. And this goes back to the international pizza. What do you think about that, uh, Lawrence? Would they get double? I'm trying, to, I'm think, I'm trying to figure it uh, I'm thinking that you're talking about the land mass, like they inherited, they inherited pretty much most of uh, Canaan, the promised land. Is that what you're trying to? Uh, I'm going to say that I'm going to put it in this way that whereas Joseph inherited a double portion of tribes, Judah inherits a double portion of nations. Nations? Yes. What are the two nations that belong to Judah? And oh, thinking of the oh, dynasty oh, of Israel, kings. Uh, uh, Israel will be the first one. Yes. And then the church? Yes, international church. Those are the two nations. That's Judah's double portion. Jesus is entitled to two nations. So you see that magnification shift from two tribes that, that Joseph inherited to two nations that Jesus, Judah, will inherit. Anyways, I think this is an awesome, again, this is all, this is middle school level. You know, we've moved up from the two individuals, and now we're looking at the dynamics of tribes. And we're looking at uh, Psalm 78 as a key psalm that uh, you'll need to meditate 
on and reflect on. Even within that Psalm 78, it's interesting that uh, that God says, on that day, I am going to send my presence into captivity. And that's what happened with the Ark of the Covenant. They went into the Philistine uh, territory. It also says, on that day, I'm going to kill my priests. That's what happened to Eli and uh, and his sons. They died that uh, during that transition. And so we, we have now this transition from Joseph to Judah. Okay, I, here's a little bit of speculation uh, on the second page of questions under the middle school uh, reflection. How does the immediate solution of King Saul fit into the expected pattern of the older serving the younger? Okay, who who would be refer, uh, re, uh, thinking as the older here? Okay, well, just think about the previous leader, right? Was Joseph, right? Mm -hmm. So Joseph was son number eleven, right? Oh, okay. does Joseph? Oh, I see. Does Joseph have a younger brother? Benjamin. Yeah. Benjamin. And what tribe is King Saul from? Benjamin. From Benjamin. 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 Yeah, I wonder. If one of the reasons why King Saul stood out as their pick was because he was a Benjamite and a younger sibling to Joseph, and Israel, I'm sure, already was aware of this older shall serve the younger motif. In their demand for a king, they thought, you know what, let's, let's go to the younger brother of Joseph. I don't know. You know, it doesn't really say it that way in the stories and the narratives. Mm -hmm. But I'm speculating that possibly this is one of the reasons why Saul could have been an opportunity, a second-born opportunity to replace Joseph. Now, Joseph, uh, Saul was unfaithful, of course, and, and, uh, yeah, and God did make some promises to Saul. He said, if you're going to be faithful in your leadership, I will bless you. And, uh, and so, he, so there, there was a willingness on God's on God's side of the fence equation to to bless Saul, but but Saul didn't um, maintain his integrity as a leader, and so we then uh, have Judah and King David uh, take over. So I, I look at Saul's forty-year reign as like a cup or a um, it's like a parenthesis to the transition to Judah. It's almost like a micro, you know, because King David reigned 40 years as well. So you have an older and a younger, the first king and the second king. Um, how does, oh, uh, and let me just finally say too, as I said earlier, that, uh, that the Benjamite tribe was included uh, in the, um, when, when Israel split up into two nations. They became uh, part of Judah, right? Yes, yes. So Judah and Benjamin stayed together. So the next question, how does Samuel qualify as a transition mediator of King Baton from Joseph to Judah? So remember we were talking about prestige, how there used to be Judges under Joseph, and now you have a dynasty of kings under Judah. What I'm proposing here is that Samuel acts as a mediator of transitioning the authority that was upon Joseph to Judah. And would that have happened? And uh, Frank's. Samuel is from which tribe again? Uh, he's an Ephraimite, right? He is. Okay. So that's from Joseph. And so when would have he been able to transition that responsibility to Judah? When he uh, anointed King David. There you go. That's how I think that anointing that Samuel does on, on David 
is the strength of my migrating the responsibility of leadership from Joseph to Judah. Joseph had that baton. Mm -hmm. He was the one who Abraham had blessed Isaac, Isaac had blessed Jacob, and Jacob had blessed Joseph. And now Joseph, through Samuel, is transitioning that responsibility to Judah, to King David. There is a similar story for the priest Baton as well. So we, we already know that Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. Judah right. uh -huh. So he's part of that dynasty of kings. So we know he has the king Baton. Did Jesus obtain the priestly Baton? Do you have any reflections on that, Lawrence? He, how he became the uh, he gained the priestly baton, Jesus. Yeah, who? The, I'm proposing that there is a transition person, just like Samuel transitioned the baton would it, of leadership. Would, would it be John the Baptist? That's what I think. I think so because John the Baptist is a great great grandson of Aaron, the first high priest. Remember, John's father, Zechariah, had been in the temple praying. So he, he, and that's only priests who could do that. Mm -hmm. Only the sons or the descendants, not the relatives. The Levites could not do that. And uh, so Zechariah was a priest. He was a grandson of Aaron. And so when John sees Jesus at the Jordan River, he recognizes that this is the Messiah. But he says, oh, I'm not worthy, right? I'm not worthy to uh, to even untie your 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 shoelaces. And Jesus says, "To fulfill all righteousness, I must be baptized by you." And that's how I look at the relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus. That John transfers the, the baton of the priesthood from from the Aaronic order to the new Melchizedek order. Melchizedek, we have both king and priest, and Jesus has both of those batons. He is both king and priest. It's a beautiful rhyming story. So that's my reflection there on the question two. So that was it. That's a good point. But uh, with the uh, John the Baptist being the great great grandson of uh, or the you know, the in the line of Aaron. Yes. We, we tend to forget, yeah, we tend to forget that because he wasn't in a in the temple setting. He was out right. in the wilderness. And... Right. So I think that's why Jesus said, I must be baptized by you. And that and then sure enough, at the Jordan River, then the, the Holy Spirit on Jesus to confirm his role. In this new priestly cast. So the next question here: How does the tension between Joseph and Judah erupt by the time of Rehoboam? So we have King David, and then King Solomon. And remember, King Solomon also started to show layers of unfaithfulness. Mm. And, uh, and God said, you know, because of my, my relationship with your father, King David, I'm not going to divide the nation during your reign. But after you die, there's going to be a division. And that's the eruption. So what happens when King Rehoboam takes over? Do you remember some of the things that caused friction with the tribes? Oh. One of the uh, one of the statements was uh, the people said to King Rehoboam, "Hey, you know, can you be easier on us? Your father was a hard taskmaster, and what was, you know, Rehoboam had a choice to make. How does he respond to this request?" I, I think you should 
he well, he listened to his friends more than the wise his advisors and then he just said no we're gonna make it even harder then yeah yeah you know my father maybe used whips when he used scorpion tails yeah. you know, my my uh, my my finger is going to be thicker than my father's wrist. That's how hard I'm going to be upon you. And so there was uh, an eruption where the ten northern tribes decided they didn't want to have King Rehoboam of the line of David of the line of Judah, and so they chose another king. Do you remember who that was? Who's a from the northern? He's the guy that set up all those uh, high places, right? Jeroboam. Yeah, the golden calf. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah Jeroboam. It, it, yeah, Jeroboam. Jeroboam. Yeah. And you know, it, it, I put down down here First Kings eleven, but it tells you what tribe Jeroboam is from. You want to take a guess? I bet you it's uh, the old. <laughs> was an Ephraimite. <laughs> he was. Yes. <laughs> Wow. Yes, he was a rebel. He was a rebel against it, yep. And so this, to me, helps underscore why the ten northern tribes said, forget Judah. You know, Abraham blessed, blessed Isaac, blessed Jacob, blessed Joseph. We're going to have a son of Joseph on the throne, not someone from Judah. I see. Ah. And, and so that's what gave strength then. Mm. In, in this, even though God had orchestrated a transition from Joseph to Judah, not an appreciation by the nation of this fact. The northern tribes say, we'll, we're, we want to go back to the old method. We want to go back to the way it used to be. And so they uh, follow Jeroboam. And so now we have then the northern 10 tribes and the southern two tribes of Judah. And then that will lead then to the last question for the middle school level. Just like we closed off with the elementary level, who are the two nations in the true tribes era? Should we go to this verse? Uh, no, that, well, this is the verse of Genesis 25 where God says to Isaac and Rebekah, the older oh, yeah. will serve the younger. They, those two boys that are wrestling and struggling are two nations mm -hmm. in your womb. They represent two nations. Right. And when we talked about the two individuals, we discerned that those two nations are the Edomites and the Israelites. But now as we've migrated to middle school, we have a different answer for those two nations based on what we've been studying about the two tribes. Who are those two nations? Yeah, Israel and uh, Judah. Judea. Judah. The northern kingdom, yes, which is often called Israel, Ephraim. Oh, I know that. And the, huh. Yes, if you read the prophets, they often talk about Ephraim uh -huh. because... Because that's um, Joseph. Jo yeah. Okay. Oh. So in a way, they're kind of referring to the king that they chose then because of, would that be one of the reasons why they would uh, still call it Ephraim, uh, the Ephraim nation or the Ephraim, yeah? Yeah, because, because Jeroboam was from Ephraim's tribe. Hmm. Let's see. Do you have? Do one of you have um, a reference to? I think Genesis, uh, Isaiah eleven. Isaiah eleven. You have any verse? Uh, am I looking for a particular verse or oh? You from Chelsea will vanish to him with slowly to from another. Yeah, verse 13. Okay. 
Yep, it says Ephraim's jealousy will really out of the NIV. Ephraim's jealousy will vanish and Judah's enemies will be destroyed. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah nor Judah hostile towards Ephraim. Okay. So yeah, so here they're just referring to Israel as uh, Ephraim then. Yes. Yes. And so it, with that in mind, you can now read the prophets and understand why you have prophets for the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. You know, Ephraim or Samaria is also the capital of, uh, of the northern kingdom. And then Judah, Jerusalem is uh, the reference for the, the southern kingdom. But just like that Isaiah 11 passage says, and then there's also one in Ezekiel, uh, I think, 20, uh, 37 or so. But uh, it says that the time is coming when these two nations that have been at war with one another and have had tension will come back together again. And that's what Isaiah 11 is saying. Ephraim will no longer be jealous of Judah, right? Oh, look at what, what God has done. He, he, he left you know, Psalm 78, he's no longer chosen us. He's now chosen Judah. And so there's jealousy between the two nations. And uh, But one day those two will come together again is what the implication is. Okay. So this is more of a, prof or a future revelation then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's uh, one of the points that I made, too, in the pearl, uh, the sea pearl with the covenants, is that there is reconciliation that comes even after the division. So the two nations are, are, will be Judah and uh, the Ephraim, uh, Ephraim or the northern uh, nation, but then the two tribes, was was it? So the, two the two tribes, of course, are are Joseph and Judah, okay. right? But the two nations that these two tribes allude to that become are the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom, and they often fight with one another, right? Right. So just like Genesis twenty five pointed out, there will be struggles. Because even when they came back, they were still. Like the Samar Samaritan people and the the Samaria was still considered a nor northern, or they were just completely out. You're right. There was still tension even in the New Testament. Enjoy. This is long after they've come back from exile. Yeah. You know the Samaritans. Remember the woman at the well. Yeah. Which where should we worship? Should we worship there where the Jews say, or should we worship here mm. where we say? You know. So there is a tension that continues on. But uh, what, what I'm grabbing out of that reconciliation is not so much that Israel will have a northern and a southern reunification, but I think it's prophetic to the ultimate two nations of Israel and the church. Mm -hmm. Israel being the first nation and the church being the second nation. Right. And right now we are at odds with one another. We often in the history of the church have been against Israel. But I think the time, the time is coming, if you read again in, about the New Jerusalem, when it descends out of heaven in Revelation 21, it has 12 foundations named after apostles. That's Israel. And it has 12 gates named after the 12 tribes. tribes. And, and, and Frank, uh, with the northern tribe, the Assyrian, the uh, Assyrian army kind of obliterated them, didn't they? Uh, they dispersed them. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay. And, and then later on, then the Babylonians uh, came down to Judah because of their continuous dis disobedience to God. Right. Okay. Right. So they both both nations ended up in captivity. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, but the northern kingdom was dispersed in a way. The Assyrians responded in a different way than the Babylonians um, as far as uh, trying to mix in with their captives. Right. Um, and so that's why the Samaritans are looked at as half-breeds right. and have a, you know, don't have a pure line like the Jewish nation did. Okay. 
Because I remember somewhere where uh, God promised David that there's always going to be a king on, on from his line. Mm -hmm. so one of the promise was when they do take him, that they'll bring him back, unlike the northern uh, nation. Right, right. And that's why Jesus is the last king. He, he is the one who will have that, that kingdom. Indeed. Yes, Jesus, he will have an eternal kingdom. Amen. And again, so when we look at the next layer with the two um, two nations, we will be talking about Israel and the church. And again, the twelve the twelve foundations are named after the twelve apostles, which represents the church, and the twelve gates represents the twelve tribes of Israel. So one day, Israel and the church will come back together again. In in the and that's where I'm proposing that the church, priests, the descendants of the high priest, and Israel will be like the Levites, where they are the relatives of the high priest, who is Jesus. Frank, um, I, I'd like to keep this recording like within an hour long. Um, so I think we have a, a few minutes. Okay. So, yeah, that that's basically it then. Uh, for our cascading example of the two tribes. We've covered now elementary school and middle school. Wow. So we'll pick up uh, slide 44 next, next session. Okay. Lawrence, is that okay? Oh yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's eight eight twenty or eight eighteen uh, Pacific Standard Time. So, Frank, thank you for uh, tonight, and Lawrence, thank you for. Uh, like I said, we're recording this. We're hoping that uh, somewhere down the road we will be able to uh, use this for further Bible study and things like that. So that's the reason why um, I I asked Frank if it's okay that, that we're recording it. So we're now at session six. Session, session seven is coming up. Frank, Sounds good. Once, once again, thank you. And Lawrence, thank you. We'll see you guys next time. All right. Thank you, Sir Leg. And again, you, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about, uh, you know, Christmas, uh, the day after Christmas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, that's right. Whether I'll be available or not. Oh yeah. Good. Thank you, Frank. I forgot. Yeah. I won't. Yeah. We have something here next Monday. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Uh, yeah. So, and the following is New Year's, is it not? No, New Year's Sunday. Okay. And so the Monday, second, the following Monday is the second. Yeah. So maybe we'll we'll resume in in three weeks. How is that? Three weeks. Okay. Yeah, we skip next Monday and the following Monday. Okay, so the tenth or yeah. the ninth? The ninth, somewhere around there. Because uh -huh. I think your Christmas and New Year's, uh, um, you know, yeah, we'll be a party. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna be partying so much. <laughs> so. Yeah, we we have a lot to celebrate. Again, I I, I really think that God has uh, has given us. Um, you know, these threads of these two individuals and these two tribes, and then we're going to talk about the two nations and the two kingdoms. But I think these are all cascading right. prophetic um, prophetic uh, teaching that God's Spirit has put into the text so that we can have a sure foundation of this hope that we have that one day Jesus, who is of the tribe of Judah, will take that throne and have the baton of both king and priest and rule over all the nations forever and ever with justice and righteousness. So we have a firm, sure assurance. And I think by looking at these cascading stories of the individuals of the tribes to, to give us a solid foundation for our hope. Amen. Well, thank you, Frank. Having said that, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Until Forever. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay. you, guys.
And Merry Christmas to you. Forever. Thank you. Okay. Forever. All right. Bye.